Here we go. It is uh, episode 157 with the great Rob Staten, who I saw a, 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 a football picture. I was, you got to say football, soccer picture of you. Rob, I mean, Jesus, man, stop working out so much. You're going to make <laughs> all the- you're going to make the rest of us look terrible, my friend. Uh, Rob Staten with the Seahawks Draft Blog, brought to you by Superior Linen Service. Family owned and operated since 1926. Uh, they provide the highest quality of products and service to the greater Puget Sound area. Get a free quote today, suplinen.com. Give them a call, 253-383-2636. Check out Rob's work, seahawksdraftblog.com. Follow him on YouTube and X. Just search uh, Rob Staten. All right, uh, what kind of football player are you? Not a good one now. Uh, it's funny that you brought that game up. So when I was a lot younger, I mean, I, I was, it was by no means a very good football player, but I could hold my own. You know, I, I wasn't too bad in my teenage years, in my early 20s. And now I'm, well, I'm 40 in 10 days. And my word, when you get to 40, does the, does the, the ability to run around like I could run around okay that bit was fine you know I could get up and down the field you know for my age I was doing all right there but the the ability to trap the ball pass the ball shoot the ball in particular as as left me as long left me there was one moment where I completely mishit this shot much to the howls of derision of not just the opposing team the many people who'd attended this charity football game in the stands, but also my own teammates who found it hilarious. So, uh, yeah, I, I've tried to move on from that experience, but thank you. You've you've reminded me that that happened at the weekend. <laughs> okay, well, but I'm just saying, like, what's the re- – I play in an old man pickup basketball, okay? Well, I've been doing this for 25 – well, yeah, 25 years. We play every Monday. Now, I mean, I, I can't – now I'm 48 now, so I'm eight years older than you. And now in the last like five years, it takes me a good three days to where I think I feel normal again. Like yep. just normal where I can actually walk without a limp. Same. That was exactly what happened to me. I woke up on Sunday feeling like I <laughs> just run the London marathon and then, uh, uh Went to the gym on Tuesday and was still feeling the effects of that. And do you know what the thing is, though, is because I, I, th- I feel there's this perception within uh, perhaps across the pond that that our football is not a particularly physical game because what you tend to see a lot of are the players throwing themselves on the floor right. and stuff like that. And, you know, you call it flopping, we call it diving. Let me tell you, this was a charity game raising money for a charity called the Youth Cancer Trust. And there was a guy on the other team who every time I made a run, so I'm playing as an, as, a, as an attacking player, and every time I made a run, he was, like, punching me in the ribs and, like, getting, you know, giving me a dig. And I'm thinking, what are we doing here? And, like, he's, he's, he's a skinhead, so he's got no – he's, like, completely shaved. <laughs> he's got this look in his face. He's, like, spitting and frothing at the he's mouth. like an actual sk- – like, just he has his head shaved or, like, a yeah. real yeah. – like a, a skinhead skinhead. Yeah, so he, he's either going bald and he's just thought, that's it. I'm very aggressively shaving every hair on my head. Beard, yeah. head, completely shaved, skinhead guy. And he wow. was he was out for his pound of flesh in this game. And uh, that is the soccer football that I grew up with. Like, it was very, very no holds barred. It, you know, almost a little bit like hockey sometimes yeah. in that anything goes. And, um, yeah, so I'm just kind of doing my bit for the sport. You know, the the flopping and the diving and that's at the top end. If you come and play a game of football over here at this level, even in a charity game raising money for the Youth Cancer Trust, you are going to get it. You know what? It is a – I think that's the – I think you nailed it because it is a much more physical game than I think people realize. But then we do see, like especially over here in the States, we that's a lot of the flopping and the complaining. I think the one thing that drives me nuts about the sport, it probably drives you nuts about it, I would assume. Cause there, but, but I will say there's a lot of things in, like, U.S. sports that drive me crazy, okay? But – it's the, oh, my God, I think I've been shot in the back, in the back leg. I cannot walk. And and I think I've got to have my leg amputated, right? And then it's 30 seconds later. Oh, I'm up and running. I'm fine. I'm, I'm good to go. It's, that, it's, it's that the, shit drives me insane. It's, it's, we talk about it every single week. You know, oh, it's, become, it's become a huge problem. Like in over here, it was more of a problem that was for like the continental Europe, like in Spain and Italy, you would see this, okay. a lot of this. And then I think as the, the players came over to play in England, it took it. But like English football, traditionally, you, if you did anything like that, 
somebody on your team would 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 have you for dinner. Like that was just not you, you didn't do that. And it's completely changed now. So we we speak about it all the time on our shows over here. And it's it's really unsavory and it's a real problem within the game. You know, the sort of the hard man image of, of football over here is gone. But you know, you get on a like say you get in a field anywhere here with with yeah. the non professionals. You know, the the amateurs and stuff like <laughs> <Yeah>. that, <laughs> or even a bunch of, of of older blokes like I did at the weekend. Um, wow, like they they are not let. If you have not been kicked from pillar to post, um, then they have not done their job. So that's that's how it was, and it was yeah. it was still a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. But you've 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 made it right. You've you're, you're through it. You're through it, and you, you're Just you're about. out so much. Uh, you're out on the uh, on the healthy side uh, right now. All right, I'm, I'm sure you saw this. Okay, so the Seahawks have wrapped up their their uh, mini camp and their OTAs. They're off. Uh, McDonald has given them the the last day off. Now it's it's summer break until they uh, reconvene there uh, for training camp. So yesterday, as we record this, it's episode 158. By the way, I think I said 157. But um, it's a one fifty eight because I haven't slept in a while, so it's, <laughs> I can't. I don't even know. Is today Thursday as we record this? I think it is. Um, but as we record this on Thursday, Wednesday was their last practice, and it was dominated uh, by the defense. There was something like six interceptions. So I don't know that if it's a good thing that they got six interceptions, or it's a bad. So good for the defense, but then clearly bad for the for Ryan Grubb's offense. They threw so many picks. Uh, three of those six interceptions thrown by your quarterback. And, and folks, remember, Rob's been on board. He thinks Sam Howell should be the starting quarterback of the Seahawks. <laughs> ah, three picks for Sam Howell. I thought he was supposed to get better in the new offense. Well, it's funny you should bring that up because just before we jumped on, I was reading the comment section on Seal Strap blog, and that's what everyone was talking about, was this <laughs> these tweets about um, the interceptions. And somebody... Uh, sort of posted some Brady Henderson tweets describing what had happened and then and then written uh oh above it. And somebody replied saying, I don't know whether this is an uh oh moment. Like isn't this a good thing? You know, that the defense <laughs> are having some success. Yeah. So it, I suppose you could look at it both ways, couldn't you? We all n- know that the defense has to improve. The way that I view uh, it, it, though, Puck, is I just assumed the defense couldn't get any worse. Like <laughs> a, an improvement <laughs> was inevitable like if if Mike McDonald basically just did nothing for the next you know three months and just sort of went off you go you know <laughs> get out there come do something like the defense couldn't be any worse so um the fact that they they had some turnovers I I, I can't say that I'm sort of thrilled and excited from a defensive point of view because I just they are going to be better you know they're going to be more organized more structured I've just, I've just listened to something with Tyler Lockett telling Rich Eisen that Essentially, Mike McDonald is running it like an army camp, and that he feels the structure is a lot. It's a lot different, but also he likes that difference to Pete Carroll. So obviously, I think they're going to be quite regimented and quite strict in what they, what the players do, and I think that will help the defense be more organized and get job get the job done. I think it is probably a little bit more concerning, as much as it can be from a from a mini camp, that the quarterbacks are throwing interceptions because that they're going to go as far as they can with the O-line and the QB. It, it's as simple as that. Like they, I do think this is a team with a lot of potential. I just get this real sense, Puck, that because it is going to be Gino who starts, that he's going to have a stretch of games. I did a bit of writing on this this, this week. He did a stretch. He's going to have a stretch of games where the turnovers happen and things don't go very well. He's also going to have a stretch of games where he looks pretty competent, I suspect, yeah. and, he's, and he's going to have a good run as well. But... You know, if you're talking about maxing out the potential of this team, they are going to need somebody who is pretty consistent and they're going to need some help from an offensive line, which I still have major reservations about. Yeah, I, I would no doubt, would no doubt, you know, come into this into, into this minicamp thinking that the, the defense would be ahead of the offense. I mean, it, it should be. Uh, not because it's, you know, less complicated because I think his defense will be more complicated than it's probably ever been with a lot of the, the, you know, disguising, trying to fool the offense and things like that. But I mean, defense is defense. It's read and react. It's more based on, you know, athleticism and skill and reacting to the play. Offense is the one that's got to put in all the plays and it's more intricate and and all that. So it's going to always take the offense a little bit longer to get going. But yeah, I'm with you. Yeah, you're right. It, It can't get worse. Um, I like the comments that have come out of, of all the players. Uh, you mentioned Tyler Lockett. I think that they're, 
needed to be a shift in just how the the tone was set and you know whether the message from Carol was stale or not and clearly um you know it probably was but you know clearly the way that he coached uh, it's very different than Mike McDonald now i think <laughs> there is th- obviously success can happen with both and Carol proved that that you can be successful the way that he managed people um, but, you know, when you do that for so long and somebody else comes in, Mike McDonald has to be himself, and he he runs a very, you know, a much more strict camp, and uh, there's nothing wrong with that, and I think there's a little bit um, of excitement around that. You've, you've touched on that. I mean, to circle back to the defense, you know, I think I liked what McDonald said, and I would agree with what McDonald said. It's clear right now that his strength of his football team is in that secondary, and if you look at Witherspoon and Woolen in particular, two guys that have played in the Pro Bowl already, uh, they've got a chance with those two in that rest of that secondary, Rob, to be pretty damn special, right? I mean, like really, really good. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I think they, they look, Woolen needs to get back. He needs to get his head right and he needs to get back on track. And if this is a sign that he's doing that, then that's fantastic. Because from the rookie Tariq Woolen was just so exciting. You kind of felt like they've done it again. They found another defensive back on day three who's going to come on and be a, an absolute steal. It had been such a long time since Seattle found somebody with legit, you know, top tier talent in the day three and and Woolen felt like he was going to be that. And then last year it was just atrocious tackling, mental mistakes, a groin grab, which was completely unsavory in the Arizona game. And, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm all for a groin grab. You can see one right over my shoulder, you know, right here, (laughs) but not it, you know, and I was in Arizona as well, but this was a very different, Growing grab. So I was not particularly enamored with that. And I don't think a lot of people were. And I don't think the Seahawks were. So I think if he can get himself back on track, Devin Witherspoon, I, you know, I'm, I'm very excited to see what he, he can be. Because look, he's a fifth overall pick. And my expectation for him this year is to go from being a good player to a great player. And I think that with this McDonald scheme, I do think they're going to move him around. I think they're going to be so versatile and flexible with him that I'm excited to see what he can be. And he is not Kyle Hamilton and they're very different players. I I even wonder whether he could do some of what Kyle Hamilton does and even maybe even do it better. And it's a very exciting prospect. I think Mike Jackson's a perfectly serviceable starting cornerback in the NFL and to have him for as cheap as they have. And then you've got a bit of competition there. The two drafted guys, Trey Brown's still there. Safeties, I've not got an issue with. I know some people have said they, you know, that they, they see that as a bit of a weakness. Clearly, the Seahawks don't. I think it's fine. So I like the look of the secondary. I have to say though, Paul, I'm still all in on that D line. For me, it's the D line that is going to make this team sing. Not just the the defense, the team. I think that is the unit that I'm most excited about on this roster. Well, I well, I hope you're right. I mean, it's 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 the group that that needs to get going and it needs a you know the kick in the kick in the, in the rear end. Um, I, I go back to what you said about Witherspoon in, in the Hamilton role. I, I just think I, I Witherspoon is everything that I think Mike McDonald looks at on paper and then looks, uh, not on paper, but it looks at him film and just, and just drools over. The guy is just a playmaker. He's physical, even despite not being that big. Uh, being physical, ball hawk. He just makes plays. He's, it's like the old John Madden. He's just a football player. Uh, and he is, and and I and I think that Mike McDonald looks at him and goes, and I can use him everywhere. There, there's not a spot that I I can't use him at. Um, so I, I'm with you. I I can't wait to see how McDonald unleashes uh, Witherspoon in this defense. Completely agree. I tell you one thing that I did find interesting today was the news that Draymond Jones has had his contract reworked. So the contract and look, I'm not. I'm I'm not a cap expert. Curtis Allen, who writes for me on Silk Draft Blog, does an amazing job with this, and he's kind of broken the details down on Twitter. Essentially, what they've done is they've pushed some of the money forwards to create about seven to eight million dollars of cap space this year, which we know the Seahawks like to have in the bank in case they want to make any moves before the trade deadline and stuff like that. And they need to have some cap space to go into the season with, and they've done that by reworking Draymond Jones's contract. What this does mean, Puck, is that they are kind of tied to Draymond Jones a little bit more. Like, I was wondering whether they keep the options open there and a potential mm-hmm. trade in training camp will be the way that they free up some money. Now they're tied to this guy. Like, next year, they've got... With the move that they've made now, they almost have to be thinking about an extension with him next year. So, 
on the one hand, I think it's a bit risky. I think it's it looks as if like if he has another underwhelming year, then you you it's going to be costly to part ways with him in twelve months' time. When otherwise it would have been very very easy. But what I think it does say is that they clearly I I think what this says is that they've been impressed with him. You know that during mini camp and maybe OTAs, they've actually thought no no he can have a really big role for this team. And let's not forget this is a player that the Seahawks twelve months ago or over twelve months ago obviously. They made the most expensive free agent in the John Schneider era, like outside free agent. They spent a lot of money on this guy. They really believed in him. And I think they've brought him in. And my McDonald's looked at him and thought, I can make this guy very productive. Justin Madabike has just had a career year and signed yeah. an absolute whopping extension. I'm not saying that Draymond Jones is going to do that, but I think it's somewhat encouraging that they've decided to do what they've done today with his contract. You, you know, Rob, you, you you see this all the time, right? When when coaches take over, you know, a new program, a, a, new, a new team, and, and those coaches are able to get something out of the players that the previous regime wasn't able to do so. I, I bet you if I asked you, you could give me examples after examples with a, a, a football team over there that has done exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. You know, I think of just off the top of my head, it just came to mind when I was thinking about it was, uh, I don't, you know, Mike Hopkins was the former basketball coach at Washington yeah. when he took over for Lorenzo Romar, Lorenzo Romar had underachieved here for the previous few seasons. Hopkins comes in and wins all these games the next few years with Romar's players, like none of Mike Hopkins' players. Mm -hmm. And, and he wins coach of the year, two years in a row. You're like, Oh my God, look, look what Hopkins was able to do. Well, the point being is the talent was always there. It's just, Whatever Romar was doing, he wasn't doing something right because he wasn't getting that talent to come out. And then Hopkins was able to do that. So maybe there's a similar situation here with McDonald. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's one of the really interesting things about this season, Puck. It's it's going to be to see who those players are. You know, players that like Derek Hall could be one of those players. Like they they took him in the early second round, and afterwards revealed through John Boyle's. Uh, article on Seahawks.com that they had a first round grade on Derek Hall. And when you watched Derek Hall last year, it made you wonder if he'd ever played football before. He was that poor. And now you're kind of thinking, well, what could he be? Like if yeah. you've got a, a fresh coaching perspective, like he always had the size, the explosive qualities, the length, the get off, the, the 10 yard split was amazing. Like everything you'd want from a, a really good edge rusher you know, he reminds me a bit of Harrison who used to be at, uh, at Pittsburgh with his size. And then he just didn't deliver last year. And now you kind of think, well, what could he be? What could Boya Maffe become? You know, what can they do with Draymond Jones? The, these are really sort of exciting things. And I can't wait to watch the defense play. It's, it's just sort of that offense, as much as I'm excited about the defense, because I, I think a lot of people, and we've talked about it, you know, the linebacker is a definite concern. Oh, yeah. But I'm 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 just encouraged by the D, the D line so much and and the secondaries we've talked about that I'm kind of more optimistic than that than than I'm worried about linebacker. But offense, it's it's still that O line and sure. consistency of the QB, which worries me. Well, it's it's got to be. I mean, there's the the there there are two big storylines heading into training camp that, that that stand out at least how I see it more than uh, more than anything else. One is is clearly going to be the health of Abe Lucas at right tackle. And whether or not he he's ready to go by training camp. Now, you know when we when we did our draft show, and this was after you popped on, and then uh, Mike Garofolo came on from the NFL Network, and he's sitting inside the network studios, and you know tipping all the picks, probably to much to the chagrin of the people at his at his network. But you know we're talking about Abe Lucas, and he starts exchanging texts at that very moment with Lucas's agent, and just asks him, "Okay, let me ask him real quick. <laughs> blah 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 blah. How is he going to be?" Now his agent said, "Well, he had the surgery, but he's going to be fine, and he'll be he'll be ready for the start of training camp." Now maybe that's maybe that's the case. It also could just be, you know, agent talk and and such. But we'll wait and see. But he hasn't done anything. Hopefully, he's going to be ready. They clearly got George Fant as the you know security blanket, but that is a question mark. And then the other one will be. I know Bradford finally came back. We expect though that the rookie out of UConn will assume the right guard spot, but. We'll see how he adjusts to life in the NFL. And then the other storyline, Rob, is, is just the play of those two linebackers. One, they just haven't been on the field. And I can't I can't remember which one is not going to be ready. They hope to have back for training camp. Is it Dotson? Dotson is the one, I believe, which is the undisclosed injury. 
or is that Baker? That's correct. What? Now Baker has that. Baker's kind of just still the recovering wrist. from yeah. the injuries he's had, and Dotson is the one where they've been a little bit vague about it. But they said that they're hoping that both of them will be back for camp. Well, yeah, and then when he said that about Dots, he's like, well, the hope is, or the expectation is ready for a training camp. And I'm like, uh-oh. Like, I've heard mm -hmm. that before. You know, when they do the, well, we hope he's ready, and I'm like, oh, that doesn't, whatever he's dealing with doesn't sound good. But, yeah, I mean, they just, you can't go into a season with, you know, O'Connell, a second-year kid out of out of Montana, God bless the Grizz, and then John Radigan, who played at Army. That, that can't be your linebackers. No, and I, I think part of this is, Hey, listen, Puck, I mean, I, I just assumed when I said earlier that I think that Draymond Jones is the move for Draymond Jones now is to have money to go into the season with, which is something that John Schneider has spoken about is really important for them. Maybe they're planning to make some kind of a move. Like maybe they're going to sign somebody this in the next couple of weeks who's a free agent. I, I've not recently had a look at the, the available free agents at linebacker. I can probably dig that out. Or maybe they're going to work a trade for somebody because – it it's it's a thin looking group. They obviously drafted the rookie, but I, I'm I'm not sold on him starting right away, and I, I think that is a little bit of a concern. So I'm well, I'm having a look here at the players who might be available. So you've you know you've you've not got a long a long list of well known players. I think Zach Cunningham's still available. Quan Alexander. These are not guys that you think. Wow, get him in. You know, Jared Davis has not lived up to expectations in his career. Is Blake Martinez still out there? Again, it's it, these are not really upgrades. You're kind of looking at the groups and of players and thinking, as I'm just running through the list here, I can't see anybody yeah. that I would want to bring in. So then you, you you kind of wonder, is there a trade out there? You don't often see trades for linebackers. And it, maybe it's somebody no. that that Schneider or McDonald knows can do a job for them that they can get a trade done with. But who that is right now, I don't know. Well, he always, he always had, he, you know, he had this, um, he had this reputation when he was working at Baltimore to be so good with these linebackers. So maybe, I don't know, he can, <laughs> he can work wonders with, with O'Connell and Radigan and, and, and all that. But I just think that, that obviously will be a storyline going into this, going into training camp. Is just going to be the health of those two, and because you haven't seen them, you haven't seen them do anything, and whether or not they're able to go out on the market, whether it's one of these free agents to pull off a deal uh, to get some more talent. I think that's why we haven't we it's, we haven't talked it's Jamal about. Adams. It. I don't want, well, I know, but it's I don't Jamal want to Adams. get into Jamal's, but it could be, but it could, but I think that's the flirtation with them. I think that's why he's keeps his name keeps being put out there. Now, again, they've never done it. They haven't done anything yet. So it could just be, hey, we're saying Jamal Adams just because we don't want to crap on a guy that used to play here. But again, uh, you know, if they get closer to camp and they realize maybe these guys aren't ready, maybe that's the time when they uh, when they finally pull the trigger uh, there on that. But uh, who knows? I mean, we've got a long ways away uh, for the start of a training camp. But I mean, what other storylines besides that? I mean, the health of Lucas, those two guys, what else is from now as 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 mini camp is over now we get to training camp what else are you kind of going to be percolating on well one thing i did pick up on a little bit this week was i think it was my mcdonald speaking about geno smith and he was saying that they need him to so i i i can't, i'm i'm going to paraphrase a little bit but essentially the consistency point and about him staying mellow as a leader and it was a point that i'd kind of completely forgotten about because it is something with smith that I think has been a little bit of an issue at times. Like, can you remember when he took the hit in in the New York Giants game last season and then reacted quite angrily to the way he was tackled and, and felt he got injured there and kind of like lost his head for a little bit and the, the offense lost its flow. And there were other times, can you remember the game in against the LA Chargers where Gino kind of lost it a little bit and Pete Carroll was there going, just breathe, calm down. That was the season before last. And... He has the, that ability to sort of, in the moment, just lose his cool a little bit. And I think maybe they're just looking for that consistent ice cold, you know, down after down consistency, not living up and down. I think they probably see that from his games. You know, I wrote about it this week, talking about how he has had sort of three meaningful seasons in his career. In my opinion, you know, he, I don't think the seasons with the Jets are what I would call meaningful seasons when he was coming into the league. The first year that he, the final year that he had rather at West Virginia, where he was 
you know, fantastic for the first six games and then for the next, uh, between then and the rest of the season, play completely dropped off. So he went from the projected number one overall pick to a second rounder. Um, his first season in, as the starter in Seattle, set off like a house on fire. Second half of the season wasn't very good. Last season didn't start very well, but in the last few games played very, very well and probably secured his return to Seattle in the process as a consequence of that. So I think it's all about consistency in terms of his emotions, his leadership and his play. And I know that for a lot of people, they just, I don't think they want to talk about that. For me, until you know either way who the long-term quarterback is, it's, it is the big issue. And yeah. I think with Geno Smith, it's it's another opportunity for him to say, I'm the guy. I suspect we're going to see more of the same, particularly behind this offensive line, and we'll be having this question mark. And then if we if we are next season put, talking again about what is the future, do you keep Smith? Do you move on from Smith? Can you draft somebody? Who else is it going to be? Is it going to be Sam Howell? Is it going to be somebody else? I think this is this has the potential to derail a lot of positives until you find a definitive answer there. What you know, one player that we haven't talked about uh, a lot, and I don't, I actually, I don't even think we've ever even mentioned him when we've talked about the offensive line because we spent so much time on Lucas and Bradford, the right side, is Lakelin Tom uh, Tomlinson. Um, it was we, this week. There was a lot of players talking about Tomlinson. Mm. You know, a lot of veterans, even Tyler Lockett, just just you know, kind of out of the blue, saying, "Man, this guy's a stud." Like. Look what he's I think it's not only just I think what he's doing on the field, Rob, it's also maybe some things that we're not seeing that are taking place uh, off the field. Uh, but I don't know, it's it's just something good to hear. I mean, this is a guy that has had, I mean, countless years in the league. Uh he has been a starter since he's come in the league. Um, uh, but um, I don't know, it, it was just I don't know, refreshing is not the right word, but it was a, it was cool to hear all of this uh, veterans of guys that have been on this team here in the last few years. Uh, praising the skill set there of Tomlinson. What, what are your expectations of him going into this year? Well, firstly, just to build off that, I mean, he spoke to the to the press this week, and I thought he spoke very, very well. It was quite interesting to listen to him speak. Wow. I, I don't think I'd ever listened to the man do an interview before. So he, he very well spoken, had real clarity. You know, he was asked about how he has been so consistently available, which is, look, it is a huge thing, especially on an offensive line that needs to build chemistry. It has been a bit of an issue for the Seahawks over the years that players kind of come in and out, line up, have had injuries. You know, he has been an iron man and touch wood. That's going to carry on this year for Seattle because he looks as if he's almost like the unchallenged starter at left guard. You know, this is a player who I remember it's a long time ago. I remember coming into the league was very suddenly like burst onto the scene and, you know, late in the draft process and ended up going very early. And then his career has had ups and downs. I, I, I think... I, I don't have a huge amount of expectation on him having a career renaissance in Seattle and, and playing his best football, but I suppose I equally am not skeptical of, of him to the extent that I think he's going to be a liability. And I think sometimes with your guards, as long as they get the job done, Puck, mm -hmm. they, can, they can be a, like, what, what's like an average grade, like a 68 on PFF or something like that. If they're just playing at that level consistently, you can have a lot of success. Like you don't expect your offensive lineman to win down after down after down, dominate, pancaking players all the time. You know, wrestling top interior offense, uh, defensive lineman and and looking like Quentin Nelson. You just need them to be able to produce enough to have a sustainable running game and some decent pass protection. Can he do that? Yeah, like that's the thing. I just also hope that. Olu Olu Atimi can do it because that's an unknown. Right guard, whether it's Bradford right. or Haynes, an unknown. You know, I thought it was really encouraging to see Abe Lucas doing some, somebody sent me a video of him doing some workouts, Puck. I have no idea what it means for the health of his leg, but, you yeah, know, he good. was doing something that I can't do. So, you know, good for him. So I, I'm hoping that <laughs> well, means that well, he's... Hey, hey, time out. I hope a starting offensive <laughs> tackle in the National Football League, Rob, no disrespect to your workout regime, can do something that you can't. 
they can do plenty of things that I can't. <laughs> and, and that workout was most definitely one of they them. They can't so play football I, like you. They can't play European football like you. I, I think in the case, that's, that's, that may not be entirely true. But uh, I suppose the fact that they are 300 pounds uh, might be at a disadvantage for this sport. But I would still would back one or two of them to be better than me. Who do you um, think would be the – hold on. Let me time out. Who do you think would be the best footballer football. on the Seahawks? That's a great question. Yeah, I know, I know. I do. I've done this for a living for many, many years, Rob. I mean, DK Metcalf would be pretty good, I think, just because oh. he, you know, the frame, the size, the the speed that he has. Would he be he a goalie? Probably... He wouldn't be a goalie, would he? No, I think he'd be. Oh. He could either be a central defender uh, or a striker. You know, he, he's got the size for that. And, and then I think sort of your more diminutive, quicker players. You know, your Tyler Lockett, Jackson Smith, and Jigba. You yeah, know. Yeah. Uh, Devon Witherspoon could be could be pretty good at that, but um, yeah, it's sort of agility and speed, or or power and you know quickness is. is what kind about of what you're D. Eskridge? For. Yeah, well, maybe he should try soccer because <laughs> you know, the NFL has not really worked out for him, has it? It hasn't. The NFL hasn't worked him worked out well for him. You know what I'm curious to, to see if like you know if everything goes well for him and he, and he's with the team and all that kind of stuff. Would he be the guy? You know the new kickoff rules, right? Would he be the yes. guy you would use? I mean. I think so. I think that's why they brought him back, isn't it? You know, they him and LaVisca Chanel will probably get the the opportunity. Because, yeah. I mean, I have to say, I, I don't... I'm a little bit confused, Puck, why, like, Robbie Anderson or Chosen Anderson or Robbie Chosen or whatever he's called is suddenly trying out for the team. Like, you've got him, you've got Chanel, you've got D. Eskridge, uh, you've got Jay Bobo, you know, um, Derek Young still. Like, they, they seem to have a million receivers who were all healthy and working out. So you would hope that at least, you know, in the term, in terms of Eskridge and Chanel, that they have decided that they are ideally suited for the new kickoff rules. Cause otherwise I don't really know why they're having a look at, at so many receivers. And that is quite interesting, isn't it? Like why, why Robbie Anderson? Like what are they, are they just looking for value there? Are they doing someone a favor? Is an agent saying, look, get my guy in there to get his name out. I don't know. Um, but they've, they've, they have got a ton of receivers on the roster already, and, and now they're looking at another one. So, All right. Well, we've got uh, some time off. We've got uh, many campus over. We'll continue to talk a little Seahawks. We'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. Training camp starts. Uh, it's, you know what, you think about it. It's like, oh, well, they get, they get a little bit of a break. It's like a month. It's like a month, yeah. and they're back. They're back, and it's training camp at Lake Washington and all that kind of stuff. So uh, we'll see if the, the health – of the, uh, the right tackle on the linebackers uh, all gets better. We'll see what they end up doing if they do anything as we get closer to camp uh, with those linebackers uh, spots. Rob, uh, you're the best. Tell everybody, what do you got cooking right now at Seahawks Draft Blog? Go to the blog. There's an article up about Geno Smith and, and the quarterback position, which is which is new for this week. So go and check that out. And hopefully th- that and this video will tide you over because I'm, I'm uh, going to be heading to to Germany next week, Puck, oh. and uh, hopefully watching England win a game, but I, I don't want to tempt fate there. <laughs> hey, we're here. We're here for you. We'll be rooting you on from afar, okay? Keep everything crossed for us, please. We, we will. We need We need it. <laughs> we will. There he is, uh, Rob State, SeahawksDraftBlog.com. Uh, check out all his work there. Also follow him on uh, YouTube there as well. Check out all the great content and videos and, and write-ups and everything. I mean, it's just a one-stop shop of just great Seahawks uh, coverage. All brought to you by Superior Linen Service, family-owned and operated since 1926. They provide the highest quality of product service to the greater Puget Sound area. Get a free quote today, suplinen.com, or give them a call, 253-383-2636. Episode 158 with Rob Staten in the books here at PuckSports.com.